All right, so now let's move on to case number three. Matt? So this is a 75-year-old man who was diagnosed with CLL about four years ago and was observed over that time with uh, some modest progression of disease, uh, but now is coming in with increasing bouts of extreme fatigue, abdominal bloating, and some intermittent moderate to severe abdominal pain. This patient has some significant comorbidities, including type 2 diabetes requiring insulin. And on physical exam in the office, the patient really has bulky lymphadenopathy, both in the cervical and axillary areas. And on an abdominal CT scan, there's a large right pleural effusion. There's also bulky uh, multistation lymphadenopathy, as well as hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. So a thoracentesis was performed and was malignant, and laboratory evaluations revealed a significant lymphocytosis with a total white blood cell count of 84,000. The patient was also significantly anemic with a hemoglobin of 9.4 and moderately thrombocytopenic. The LDH test was normal at that time at 262, but the beta-2 microglobulin was very elevated. Some other molecular testing was performed, including FISH testing, which was normal, IGHV mutation status, which was unmutated, and then the patient was positive for ZAP70 and had somatic mutations in both TP53 and in NOTCH1. A bone marrow biopsy was performed at that time that showed diffuse infiltration by CLL. So to, to start with this case, I wanted to uh, talk to, with Dr. Bagg about what the prognosis might be based on these molecular markers. So in terms of the uh, additional studies that were performed, of course, these studies are not diagnostic studies. They are, these are prognostic studies, and I think that's important uh, to, to, to make a note of. Uh, normal fish, uh, so that excludes the usual and customary four or five or six aberrations that are looked for by fish, uh, abnormalities of chromosome 11, Q22, deletions, trisomy 12, uh, deletions 13Q14 and deletion 7P, 17P, excuse me, the, the usual panel that's looked at. What's uh, missing from this is uh, cytogenetics, conventional karyotypic cytogenetics. And I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that even though fish is remarkably useful in picking up aberrations that may be missed uh, on metaphase analysis, metaphase analysis remains important, uh, and that is typically done on uh, stimulated cells to uh, in Induce the neoplastic lymphocytes to divide. And so, for example, you may have a completely negative fish panel, but cytogenetics may show a complex karyotype uh, that would be prognostically relevant. It may show an immunoglobulin heavy chain gene translocation, 14Q32, that may not be on the fish panel, that may have prognostic relevance too. With regard to the actual mutational studies, the presence of an unmutated immunoglobulin heavy chain gene variable sequence indicates that this. CLL has not transited the germinal center and that these uh, cells or patients with this flavor of CLL tend to have a worse prognosis. The positivity for ZAP70 is interesting. I'm not sure how many laboratories are still doing this, and maybe that's a point of discussion, to prognosticate in CLL. In the early days of uh, looking at immunoglobulin heavy chain gene variable uh, region mutation analysis, the testing was laborious and cumbersome, and people looked for surrogates. And one of the surrogates that emerged was ZAP70, uh, with the expression of ZAP70 uh, correlating with unmutated immunoglobulin genes. Uh, there was also some literature to suggest that ZAP70 in and of itself could be a prognostic variable, and even some literature to suggest that ZAP70 was an even more potent prognosticator than was the presence or absence of immunoglobulin heavy chain genes. I think nowadays with fish panels and mutational panels, uh, it has fallen by the wayside in terms of being used and looked at at a routine basis. The mutated P53 gene, of course, uh, indicates a poor prognosis. And although um, they are often accompanied by a deletion of 17P, when the mutation is there, about 30% of patients have a mutation alone without the deletion uh, of the other P53 gene detected by FISH. Notch 1 uh, is one of the genes on uh, small panels that can be looked at in CLL patients. Other genes might be SF3B1, uh, BRK3, ATM, amongst many others. And Notch 1 mutations, which were found in perhaps 5 to 10% of patients with CLL, uh, are a poor prognosticator in general terms, with some additional data to suggest it's a risk factor for uh, Richter transformation.
Great, so these prognostic factors are clearly important as we decide on which therapies to use, but certainly another thing that's important is the comorbidities of the patient. And, and we know, Dr. Jane, that there's sort of less formal ways to assess this and also some formal ways to assess comorbidities that are often used in clinical trials. Maybe you could briefly just take us through that. Sure, so uh, I think uh, you know, assessment of comorbidities is important for patients with CLL, and I would say that was more relevant in the context of chemoimmunotherapy era. So German CLL study group has typically used SIR score and uh, anything, it's a scoring system based on different comorbidities and you can uh, count the number of comorbidities a patient has, such as heart disease, kidney disease, um, other diseases, diabetes, hypertension, and a SIR score of more than six is considered high risk uh, and they are considered less suitable for chemoimmunotherapy. Um, uh, in our group, and I think in most centers in the United States, uh, typically I think age of the patient, uh, looking at the renal function, I think those are the more important ones which we look at, and performance status of a patient. I think making a decision, if you're electing for chemo chemoimmunotherapy, you know, those are the decisions which come into mind, how old the patient is. If a patient has poor renal function, then patient may not be appropriate for intensive chemotherapy such as with FCR. So those are the things uh, I generally look at when I look at a patient uh, in terms of their comorbidities and how we assess them. We've talked about a number of important prognostic factors, the FISH, the IGHV status, and then these different somatic mutations, and often they kind of line up, but this is kind of an unusual situation here. We have a patient who has a TP53 mutation, but does not have deletion 17P. The FISH is normal here. Right. So how do you think about that for this patient? Yeah, so most of the, so for sure this is a bit unusual because I think 90 to 95% of patients who have deletion 17P have a concomitant P53 mutation. Now certainly there are, again, 5 to 10% of patients where there is a discordant result where either you have DEL17P or you have P53 mutation, which appears to be the case here. Now the studies have shown that presence of either one of them uh, is a high risk feature. So this patient do, does not have deletion 17P, but the patient has mutated P53, so he should be man the patient should be managed as a patient who has lost a P53 function and, you know, and would be less suitable for chemoimmunotherapy in the current era. Great. And Dr. Weirda, based on these prognostic markers and, and the other features of this case, what's, what's your suspicion here for the risk of Richter's transformation? Well, based on the presence of the NOTCH1 mutation, that puts the patient in a bit higher uh, uh, risk for, for Richter's uh, transformation. That has been associated with Richter's uh, transformation. The mutation of TP53 perhaps puts the patient at a, at a higher risk, although there's less clear data that, uh, that, that would make that association. So I think the other feature that we haven't talked about yet that makes this patient unusual is the um, malignant pleural effusion. So that's a high-risk feature, not necessarily a risk for Richter's transformation, but the biology for, of the disease for this patient is a bit different than your typical patient who's 75 with CLL. Um, there's something different about these cells that give them a propensity to collect in the, in the pleural space and, and to, 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 to give a, a malignant pleural effusion. And it is a higher risk feature uh, clinically, uh, having a malignant pleural effusion like this.